All right, I need you to be really bold and brave, and you're going to have to vote on some of these things, all right? Because I'm looking for people who have finished a major project in your life. How many of you have ever done, like, from start to finish, built something with wood and put something together, constructed something like a chair or a table or something like that? Any woodworker people? Raise your hand. Come on. Don't be shy. This is your chance to show off on Easter. Okay, good. All right, you've put some things together. Uh, Pottery or art? Who's my pottery or art people? You've, like, put, like, created a, like, a mug or a I know, that's, that's the thing I always think about. Yeah. You've done something like that? Okay, that's awesome. Uh, how many uh, are people, if you've been on a championship winning team, even like your little intramural team, championship winning team, like start to finish, come on, you won the title, good. So these are all the champions, look around the room, find them, they're great. Uh, anyone in here run a half marathon? Anyone? Half marathon? Yeah? A co- Half, yeah, oh, several people. It's actually impressive. Whole marathon, anyone? We just want to find the insane people. Whole marathon, that's amazing. Yes, that's incredible. It's amazing to start something and then get all the way to the end to finish. It's kind of an incredible feeling. With something we all chase after in some way, shape, or form is to like actually work on something really challenging and really difficult and find yourself at the end, finishing well. It's an awesome thing. Uh, There's an article on the fastest man in the world. His name's Usain Bolt. It's a sprinter from Jamaica. He's got all the world records and the 100-meter dash and 200-meter dash. And he talks about how, in fact, he was saying in the article, he's like, I'm actually not a great starter. It says, I'm not that super strong at the start, but it's actually how I finish, finish the race. He says, at, at 50 meters, what I do is I look both ways to see where I'm at. By the way, this is all happening inside of nine seconds. It's kind of insane. <laughs> but he's sprinting, and at 50 meters, he's looking to see where he's at because he knows the last 40 meters of the race are his. And he looks at about 10, he said, he looks at 10 meters out to see if there's anyone with him so that he can slow up and save his energy for the next race. These are freakish, amazing people. (laughs) But I just thought it was the most incredible thing to think about how his eye is on the finish. He doesn't necessarily start really well, but he's always looking to finish. Finishing something well actually matters. Why? Why? Because how well we finish something tells us how valuable the goal really is. How much you're willing to go all the way to the end to finish something. It actually says something about what you care about. How valuable it is. I can think of a ton of things that I've started and totally fizzled out on. Why? Because it wasn't just super sold out. It's maybe sound like a good... You ever been there? Of course you have. You started out something, you were like, eh, I don't know if I love this anymore, right? You fizzle out. This is actually a moment we're about to look at here because it feels like there's this moment where Jesus is on this cross. And I can't imagine all these people who had dedicated their whole lives to him and followed him for the last three years, it maybe felt like things were just fizzling. They had a hope that something significant, magnificent what happened and Jesus is hanging on a cross and it just feels like this thing didn't finish well. That's the feeling that they, I think they had at that moment. In fact, they're not anywhere to be found. The, the followers of Jesus are nowhere. There's one of his disciples is hanging around at that moment. It's a pretty dark moment, pretty hard and difficult place. We're in the middle of this series where over the last just few weeks we've been talking about this moment where Jesus is on the cross and he has these few things to say while he's there in the process of dying. And he makes this unbelievable statement as he's nearing the very end of his life. He's lost his strength. He no longer has the ability to push himself up to take air into his lungs and he's slowly suffocating, and he cannot go on any longer, and he makes 
this final, decisive, unbelievable statement. You're there in your Bibles in John chapter 19. I just want you to look at it with me. Verse 29, John chapter 19, verse 29, it says, a jar full of sour wine stood there. And so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, uh, at first glance, it might just feel like what he's saying is, it, I'm done. It's over. It's finished. But that's not actually what he's saying. There's, you actually look at the Greek language. There's a couple of different words to talk about finishing something. There's a, in the Greek language, there's a word for the idea of end or quit or stop or, 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 or ceased. It's this word pavo. And it means quit, stop. End, cease, be done. In fact, this, you'll find this Greek word all throughout the Bible, all throughout the New Testament. In fact, there's a, a, a biblical, a historical account where there's this massive storm that Jesus' brothers, his boys, his, his guys, they're in the boat, uh, and he's exhausted. He's wiped out, and he's sleeping, and the boat is getting rocked as the storm comes over the Sea of Galilee, and he's there, and they're freaking out like... This thing is not going well. And, and they go get Jesus, and they're like, hey, could you wake up? Could you help us? And Jesus sees the storm going on, and he, it says, the scripture says, he rebukes the storm, and immediately it says, the wind ceased. Pavo. It stopped. It was over. This word exists, but this is not the word that Jesus uses when he's there on the cross. He actually used, we use three words. It is finished. There's actually just one word that he says, one final decisive word. And he's there as he's hanging on the cross and he says, to tell us die, to tell us die. What is tetelestai? What does that mean? It's a completely different meaning than babo. It means complete, satisfied, accomplished. Complete, satisfied. These were words that many people use. Artisans of the day would, when they finished their artwork, they would say tetelestai. Like, a, this is my creation. This is what I've done here. A worker would go to his boss at the end of a day and say, to tell us is incomplete, done. meaning not that there's no more work to be done, not that there's anything that's not going to continue on. It's just that I've satisfied my work for the day. It was a word of accomplishment. It's what I've done. If a man was indebted to another man and he was having to work off his debt, when he finished paying off the debt, He'd say, to tell us die. Meaning finished and indicating freedom, the ability to be free. Or if two warriors were fighting against each other, when one was victorious, he'd say, to tell us die. Complete, victorious. See, the idea here is Jesus isn't saying that anything has stopped. What he has said is, everything has been accomplished. Accomplished. Done. The question is, well, what was accomplished? What was completed? Right? What was accomplished? And it is a simple answer for every one of us. That is, I am making you alive. You want to know what was accomplished in this moment? What he's declaring is he's going into the grave to be raised again is to say, I'm making you alive. There's an exchange that's beginning to take place. The apostle Paul in a letter to a church in Ephesus, he 
He's writing and he just makes a profound statement. He says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, meaning all of our brokenness, our sin, our failures, our shame, our guilt, all of it, when we were dead in it, God made us alive in Christ. For by grace, you've been saved. Now, what does that mean? See, to a man or woman in here, every one of us, we know why we're here this morning. We're here to celebrate a historical figure who really lived and who really did go to a cross and he really did hang there and he really did die and he really did go into a grave. And from all historical account, he really did rise from the dead. And we're here celebrating that moment. It's why we've come. I don't know that there's much really dispute in that. But that's not the seminal issue is that he died and went into the grave and that he came out alive. The question is, why? Why? Why is he hanging there on a cross? Why is he going into the grave? Why is he coming out alive? Is he there just to show that he was serious and dedicated to his message? No, that's not why he died. Does it show how dangerous he was to the establishment? No. It's not why he died. Or to show how important his life teachings would be? No. That's not why he died. Now, to be sure, his life teachings are game changers. And he rocked the establishment. And he was serious about who he was and what he said and what he did. That's all true, but that's not why he died. He's there because at the end of the day, we were dead. And there's nothing we could do about it. We were dead in sins. You and I have a mortal wound. Every human on the planet actually faces this reality, including the preacher standing here this morning, a mortal wound called sin. And this life is actually a battle for do we experience, is there a chance for us to actually have life? God is the author of life. And you and I are actually in here breathing in and breathing out. But the question is actually, are you alive? That's actually the question because the scripture is saying we were dead, dead in trespasses and sins. How many of you are uh, zombie movie fans? You're like, why would you even ask that on an Easter morning, Pastor? Or why would you think that I would tell you if I am? This is... I'm just going to be gut level honest with you. This is what it means to be taking air into your lungs on this earth, but to be dead in sin. It's like being a zombie. You may be walking and you may be functioning, but you are not alive. And that's why Jesus was going to the cross is because we couldn't fix it. We couldn't change ourselves. We could not make ourselves from zombies and broken to alive and hopeful. And when we were dead, that's what he said, he wanted to make us alive. Ephesians chapter 2, we'll go back there. It says, you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked following the course of this world. As all of us. Verse 4. But God, but God being rich in mercy. Because of this radical love with which he has loved you. And if you're even here in this morning and wondering like, could God even possibly love me? Boom. Here's your answer. 
because God's love for you was not predicated on you being alive. In fact, because you're dead, he wanted to show and prove how radically he loves you. And what he did is when you were dead in sin and brokenness and failure and disappointment and hurt and misery, God made you and I Alive says, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with, with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Hear this, verse six, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That means what Easter is actually about is taking this broken frame, this broken man, this broken person, this broken woman, and taking us out of the grave we were already in, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places so that you and I could actually live. We can live. We don't have to be under the weight of our own brokenness because we all feel it. We've all been there. Doesn't matter if you've been following Jesus your whole life or you're in here and you're not even sure about this thing that I'm talking about. What we all actually know really well deep down is we don't have it. We can't do it. And so... Jesus came. He's so rich in mercy and so radical in love. He made us alive and he raised us up with him. John 10 says it this way. There's a thief that only wants to come to kill, steal and kill and destroy. But I came that they may have what? Life. Life. And have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Why did the shepherd come? So that we could have a good teacher, so that we could have a great philosophy, so that we could have some really good morals, so that we could help a few people. Hear this. No. Jesus wasn't looking to establish a cool religion for you to get on board with. Jesus was looking to take dead hearts and make them alive. He says, I came that they may have life to those that were justly condemned. Every one of us. How? Because I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to give my life so that you can have life. So that when he says it is finished, he's saying, I laid my life down so that you can have it. That's what is accomplished. God is so serious, hear this, about life. And he's so serious about justice. He's so serious about love. And he's so serious about that which is right. And the truth is, is we were broken and separated from God. That's every one of us, all of us. We're all separated. The singers on the stage The preacher here this morning, from the front to the back, across the earth, separate, dead, dead. Zombies can't do anything, but he made us alive. And so Jesus is saying, I offer you new life. That's what you get this morning, new life. You can have new life. And that's text in John chapter 10 says this. However, there is an enemy who is out to convince you to take life away from you, to steal and kill and destroy. What does that mean? To take life from you. The enemy's greatest lie is this. You don't need God. You can do this on your own. There it is. You don't know what the greatest lie is? You can, you can do it all on your own. You don't need God. You can keep doing your thing. You can keep rising up. If you do well in relationships and you do well in career and you get enough dollars, you can go on some cool adventures and experience some cool things before you die and you'll be great. There's life. Hear this, church. That's not life. It's not. It's 10,000 celebrities who are all there to show you they've got it all. 
They don't have life. They're hurting. They're broken just like you and me, right? Because it's on the tabloid every other day. (laughs) Tabloid. Who reads that? The internet. I don't even know what I'm saying. (laughs) Come on. Come on. Every amazing person out there takes four seconds to find they're just searching for the same thing everyone else in this room is searching for. And the fame hasn't fixed it and the dollars haven't fixed it and the relationships don't fix it and the next cool thing, to, nothing fixes it. And God's just going, I can fix it. I so, have so much mercy and so radically love you, I can fix this for you. I'll send my one and only son to pay a price for you. You can't, you can't pay for yourself. The cost is death, but I'll send my son so that you can have life. And the lie is, you don't need God. And I'm just humbly here to tell you, you need him. Deeply, desperately, I need him. Deeply, desperately, this morning for life. And yet, here's what's amazing. You could have turned your heart and turned your back on this God and told him he's a, 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 an apparition of your imagination and turned away from him and run a million miles away and gone against him your whole life. And yet, here's what's amazing. There's an open invitation right now from him to have life. I mean, I can, have, I can be a dumpster fire of a human and God would take me even now? The answer is yes. There was a brother, we talked about it last week, who was right on a cross, right next to him. His life was an abject mess. And just, he with that ounce of humility said, oh my, I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. My life is such a mess. But Jesus, would you just remember me? And Jesus says, absolutely today you'll be with me in paradise. That's who our God is. This is unbelievable. This is incredible. It is far beyond anything we absolutely deserve. You could be running from God your whole life with one ounce of humility, he says, if you'll turn your heart to him and say, I I can't do it, I need you. He says, okay, come into the family. He's ready to receive. And so how does that manifest in our everyday life? When you talk about getting new life, what does that actually mean? means you and I can right now just step into a fresh start. In Colossians chapter 3, another letter written to a church just in need. And he just says, hey, come put on the new self. It's being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. I mean, you can just step into and even receive today a new start. That every day could actually be a moment for a fresh start to put on the new self. Yeah, you guys ever, uh, when you were kids, we, we lived in it when I was a young kid, we lived in a cul-de-sac. So it was amazing because we could play games all the time. We'd play like kickball and football and all the, all the things in this cul-de-sac. But every once in a while, you'd be in the middle of a play and then a car would come in to our cul-de-sac. <laughs> and they would mess up the play. And do you remember what you'd, you remember what you'd say? Game off or do over. Do over. Do over because they messed up the thing. We, we messed up the thing. And God is saying, I'll, I, I'm the God of second chances. It's who I am. You can come and be made new and real. That's the power of what Jesus did on the cross. He's here this taking our pain and our wounds and our fears and our hurts and the challenges in front of us and the sorrows and our failures and our guilt and our shame and all of those things. And he gathered them on himself on the cross. Every broken thing about you was weighing upon his shoulders on that moment when he said it is finished. And he took those things into the grave. But that wasn't the end, was it? By the power of the living God, he came out of that grave, alive and victorious, 
so that you and I could be alive and victorious. He overcame death. He overcame destruction. He overcame sin and failure, and he rose victoriously so that we could be given not just life, but hear this, holiness and purity and righteousness and beauty. Everything you've ever wanted, peace and hope and rest, everything you've ever desired, purpose, identity, worth, value, everything you have ever wanted in your whole life comes on the voice of the king who says, it is finished. I make you alive. It's who you are. And he puts on, we get glory and honor. And it's not because anything we will ever do There ain't enough sermons to preach to get yourself there. It is because he is good, merciful, and loving. And there's an open door, an open invitation. And so you and I get to ask the question, what, what, what would it be like if we could wipe the slate clean and it could start over? What if, what if? You take the whole of your life and for it to be wiped completely clean and to get to start over, what would you do? How would you live? If you could have a completely brand new trajectory, Jesus is giving that kind of hope. You could have your slate clean. Again, this is what it means to be with him. This is what we want. I want the hope of like fresh life ahead. You can think of your favorite movie right now. Every one of them. It's just about hope. That's where it's at. It's where the whole world's just trying to land. It doesn't matter if it's Braveheart. It's just mine. Or Legally Blonde or whatever it is out there. I don't know. Whatever your thing is. All right. Every Every movie out there, even the new ones that are trying to have sad endings and stuff like that, they're all just trying to get you, could you think about life differently? Everybody's actually just reaching for hope. That's all they're trying to do. Everybody's just desperate for hope. And he offers it. So that when you and I say yes to him and we offer him our lives and we say, take my sin and shame and guilt, and we do that, He receives it and he offers us something fresh so that, hear this, no matter how dark your days are, because some, come on, this is real life. There are gonna be just some dark days. No, no, No real faithful preacher or herald of the, the Bible or the word of God is gonna sell you a bill of goods saying, if you follow Jesus, all your wildest dreams will come true. What he's saying is, if you follow Jesus, no matter what you may face in this life, you will have it all forever. You may face darkness or you may face, in fact, you will face mountains. You're gonna face some things maybe that even feel insurmountable at times or even go on a journey that feels really painful and hard. Your ending trumps the ending of any movie you've ever seen. Your ending trumps it all. In him, in Christ, apart from him, Broken, dead, apart from him, dead, with him, life. And that's the exchange. Our end is secure, and that's where we're at. That's the invitation. Come and have new life. There it is, right here this morning. Doesn't really matter where you're at. That's a fresh invitation. John chapter 7. On the last day of the feast, the great day Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Everything you've ever wanted. Everything you've ever wanted. And that's the invitation, come and drink. You're parched, you're tired, exhausted, thirsty. Come and drink. That's what we're going to ask God to do. 
Would you guys do that with me this morning? It's just let's come thirsty to the Lord and ask him for a fresh start. Father, I'm asking this morning, you just give us this moment. Wherever you are, and I know you got amazing things later today and family pictures and lunch and all the great things. I'm so grateful. We're so grateful, God, for all that. But would you just take this moment of sincerity with the Lord? Lord, we just want to ask, would you come and be faithful and like you always are and you've always done to offer new life? a fresh start. And if you're here this morning and you're going, I need a fresh start. I need to be renewed and restored. I feel tired. I feel exhausted. Maybe you've been following the Lord your whole life. Been walking with Jesus, but you've felt beat down. Would you just ask him right now? Lord, refresh me, revive me. Refresh me. I need fresh life. I want to do things on my own. If you've been walking kind of your own path and trying to do your own thing apart from him and in many ways have been a zombie, if you will, kind of trying to get through life, but not really having life. Would you ask him right now, lead me? I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And I'm asking for new life. What you finished is a new beginning. So, Begin in me. I just say if you're here this morning and you've been running from God, maybe you've never, you've never given him your heart. You never had the opportunity to make that exchange to say, I'm gonna give you all the broken things about me. Everything that's fallen short and every way I've failed, every way I've been hurt every way I've hurt others, every broken thing about me, I want to offer it to you. You can offer that to him right now. Would you do that and make an exchange? And would you ask him, you can even just pray with me, Lord Jesus, would you come and change my heart? Would you take my brokenness? Would you take my sin? Would you take my shame? I don't want it anymore. I'm giving it to you. And now, Jesus, I receive your life and I receive your holiness and I receive your mercy and I receive your goodness. Would you come and be Lord over my heart? You can ask him even now. You don't have to worry. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I am asking you to be honest and authentic with the Lord right now. You don't have life and you you need it. Ask him for it. Lord, I thank you that there's a host of us in here that need new life. We're so grateful. We thank you, Jesus, that you did not stay in the grave, but you came out alive victorious. We thank you that you finished, accomplished, completed the work. You lived a sinless, stainless life so that we could be alive. And we receive that life now. Would you receive it? Receive it. Life and life to the full. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us. Stir our heart to walk with you today and tomorrow and the next day to receive your gift of life. Be free from sin and 
shame and to walk in freshness and newness. We thank you. You guys stand with me. We're going to close this morning. We're going to sing. We're going to just finish with this song. But as we finish with this song, I want to encourage you just to make this your prayer unto the Lord. Giving your heart to the Lord and saying, hey, you lead me faithfully into the fullness of life. The ground could not contain you. Therefore, sin cannot contain me. So I'll walk in the fullness of life. God, thank you for a chance to finish this morning a chance to express our love and gratitude to you for all that you are and all that you have done, making us new. We treasure you. We love you. We worship you.